Robert Towns doing blow the time, constantly rewriting it. So all the actresses and the actors and the people, the athletes are just like, oh my God, they're sitting around. It's supposed to be six weeks. It turns into six months. It just keeps on going. Right. Can you imagine so Mariel, like, having professional like, athletes, professional athletes yeah. being led by a coke head. <laughs> Such a weird, <laughs> such a weird dynamic. Say. Sorry, go ahead. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. All right, everybody. Welcome yeah. to one fucking hour. I'm uh, Evan Husney. And joined, of course, uh, well, first to my left uh, by Tom Fitzgerald. Tom's here. Oh, oh my God. It's one fucking hour time again. <laughs> but uh, but to my right, we got no Marcus this time, uh, this fucking hour. Because uh, yeah. this fucking hour, we got... Well, he got uh, monkeypox, right? <laughs> so <laughs> oh, he's out for a couple of weeks. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he's, oh he's uh, monkeypoxing over in Ireland uh, this week and actually next week. So filling in for us for this week and next right. week uh, is uh, the uh, returning champion of one fucking hour, uh, Miss Ramey Bennett. Ramey, how's it going? Hi, nice to be here. Thank you guys for letting me uh, fill in for Marcus. Oh, right on. Right on. Welcome back. And uh, you are, uh, we are here. This fucking hour is episode 30, everybody. Kind of hit a little minor milestone there. Um, and it is uh, going to be on the 1982 film Personal Best. So without further ado, I'm going to start that uh, countdown. The hour clock will start now. All right. Little. Uh, Background on the movie, Personal Best, as I said, is the 1982 uh, film. It's the uh, athletic drama directed by the infamous new Hollywood screenwriter Robert Town, which follows an aspiring young track and field star, played by Marielle Hemingway, on her journey to becoming an Olympian in the late 70s. While navigating the grueling realities of competition, personal excellence, and identity through her friendship and romantic partnership with a fellow female athlete and mentor. I think we should start talking about um, this one specific mo uh, scene in the movie, uh, the scene that I'm calling the first date scene uh, between uh, Tori and Chris in the film, because I think it's really emblematic of all the key themes in the movie and also just kind of what uh, Robert Town was going for in this movie. I think the movie begins and centers around the, uh, the U.S. Olympic trials in 1976, and you sort of get a glimpse of that. And then everybody who's sort of trying out for that goes to the university bar where they all start like hanging out. And then Marianne Hemingway's father kind of comes over to the table of Tori, who's sort of the upstart track star that everyone's sort of um, oogling over. And she, and then these two characters meet, but then Mary Well Hemingway's character kind of, I don't know, she gets overwhelmed and sort of semi passes out. And then Tori swoops in and kind of takes her under her wing. And then the two of them go to their apartment where there's a pretty good age difference. Just, I yeah. think that's, uh, should be emphasized. I would say sure. that in, in her mid to late twenties is Tori, but really uh, Mary Hemingway's character is just like, you know, 18 or yeah. 17, you know, so there is this age difference that it's not what the film's about necessarily, but, um, especially in the, with Mariel's character, it's, there's a significance to it. Yeah. And, and when we first see, uh, Mariel Hemingway's character, Chris, she has just performed very badly at the trials. And so right. she's very disappointed, very bummed out. And then she's got this like tough coach dad who's giving her a hard time. So like, that's sort of the, the setup. Mm. And then when she goes into the cafeteria bar area, she's bummed out, kind of disoriented and, and really down on herself. And Tori kind of clocks this dynamic with like the tough dad father. And there's like instantly this recognition that happens like right away. Right. So. And then but then she kind of like short circuits, passes out. And then Tori yeah. takes her under her wing. Then they go and they sort of go back to their uh, the dorms. Uh, t right. To Tori's room. And that's where they just start to like hang out, smoke pot you know, watch TV and it's this really kind of great moment that I just can't really, 
uh, put my finger on in terms of seeing it in movies of that time. Like I can't think of any other example of something that feels that na- naturalistic with like two girls hanging out, you know, in terms of even, getting to even know each kind other. of in modern in modern times, because what, what happens is, you know, they're kind of they're letting off steam. She's had this really stressful moment and Tori sees that. And so it's loosening her up. They're smoking a joint. They're drinking beer, messing around. <laughs> Tori's like burping. And then then. Tori pulls Meryl Hemingway's finger and she farts. And like yeah. the whole thing is like, it's just this really, they're like totally just like growing down together. And right. you know, that then, then we have the arm wrestling that, that happens. Right. Um, but I think what's so cool about this scene, yeah, like what you were saying, Evan, it's like, it's like, there is such a naturalism that you don't even, you never see in like a, even a modern male female dynamic that is leading up to like almost like a first date moment. Like you don't even really see that, like where it's two people who are just like, there is this affinity and there's this naturalness and like the dialogue's very natural. They're sharing kind of insights about their life. They're relating on things and they're kind of touching all these levels where, you know, they both obviously have like, they probably had the same experiences with the father who was, you know, right. tough on them and they had the coaches and, and, and Tori sees this in her and like, and kind of wants to reach out. And so the scene sort of starts to progress and then, you know, they're talking about the idea of competition and like what it means to have a killer instinct. And I, I right. think this theme is something mm-hmm. we'll, we'll talk about probably throughout this hour, but that like that, that's sort of this underlying theme, like to, to do what they're doing, to be that singular in your sort of myopic interest to become an Olympian. Like you have to supposedly have this killer instinct and that's sort of what they are, what Meryl Hemingway's character is, is, is going to be yeah, developing. And- and She's everything. finding that in herself over right. time. Right. The film takes place over four years. Exactly. So, you know, Chris, that character does certainly, quote unquote, grow up, you know, in a, in a myriad of ways um, from professional and in, with relationships, you know, and that's that's a lot of what we're seeing. That's what uh, is a big engine in the film. Yeah. Know? Right. And then it's cool with the with the arm wrestling, because it's like it's a really amazing sort of narrative technique that Robert Town is doing, because in that one moment, you're sort of getting the whole setup. Like they're saying, yeah. how competitive are you? Well, what 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 kind of totally. guts do you, how gritty are you? And then they're having this face off where you can kind of like see all the levels of their character in that one moment and they're right. testing each other. And it, basically the rest of the film is about these two people who care deeply about each other, ultimately having to also compete with each other. And then how, how do you, you know, how, yeah. how do you reason with that situation? But there's an eroticism, there's a sensuality too, that right. um, another nice thing about this film is that, okay, it's lesbians and that's so tired. It's a nightmare, you know, with like R rated movies, you know, it's just for titillation. It's just, you just, even today, you know, it's, right. um, it, it's, it's still, it's a cheap, you know, way to like, you know, sell tickets basically. And uh, it's not, it doesn't read that way in the film and it doesn't play out that way either. And even in the way that scene does uh, develop into a, a, an erotic moment. You know, so that's another kudos for the film. And actually, uh, we were talking about that scene being emblematic uh, of the film in general, but also we were just talking before we started taping that something about that film, this film for me is like, it's not a woman's film, like a Joe Clayburgh kind of film, which are great, you know, like uh, it's my turn and Unmarried Woman. But it is a woman's film because it's, it's, it's all about female characters the center of the film which is very progressive especially back then and it's not an lgbtq film but it is in that that's not the message and the thrust of it because same year there was a film called making love about two gay men being closeted or out or whatever and having issues and but that's not what personal best is about but it is certainly involved in the film and it is a representation of a same sex, uh, you know, like a relationship and coupling. And that's awesome because it's, it's again, that naturalism keeps coming back. And then also it's a, it's a sport. It's not a sports film, right? You know, it's not like, like grab the gold, you know, kind of, it's not like, <laughs> uh, you know, like Rocky yeah. or something. It's, but, but of the course bronze? it endeavors, Hey, always, you know, enjoy <laughs> the show, but it's, but it, of course in, it, it's in the milieu of sports and sports is very significant for me, for yeah. many reasons. And it's metaphorical, I think to town in a lot of different ways. So it is and it isn't, is all I'm trying to say. It's also not a love story in the sense of like, will they, won't they, you know, like, oh, they broke up, misunderstanding, they get back together at the end. But it is a love story between the two female leads. So what I love about that is it's not those things with the claptrap uh, expectations, especially mainstream film. Right. 
but it, it really is just about people, their emotions yeah. and their relationships. And I know it sounds almost trite, but it's just, I'm just saying it's very refreshing because it doesn't fall into any of the pitfalls well, of message films or, mm-hmm. uh, or easily cliched films with um, easy expectations of the audience. And, and, and that's, and of course, the movie bombed, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never connected well, with that, audiences. <laughs> it's definitely that era where, you know, the sort of existential movie, you know, would get made or something, you know, that sort of touches on, you know, that, that, that's hard to classify, hard to compartmentalize. And I think that yeah. this movie is so great because it, it is all those things and it isn't all those things. And it's kind of there's this gray area sort of in between. I think that's what makes it so interesting and why we're even talking about it today, you know. Yeah. Um, and, but and I think that's why, well, yeah, like to your point, it stands the test of time because it, because it's not didactic. And like you said, it's not a message film that's, that's hitting you over your head. It's, it's a human film about a human experience about the specific topic, which is almost an insider view of the subculture. And yeah. I think, and that's, if we want to start talking about Robert town and kind of the origin of that. I think that's a good place to yeah. talk about that. And we can go into that. Let's yeah, do absolutely. it. Absolutely. And, and, yeah. and, and to, to just uh, transition, I, I've always felt this is really one of the last seventies films um you know it was the production was greenlit and started before heaven's gate came out and the repercussions of heaven's gate and how it turned uh hollywood upside down and it went from the apocalypse now town to the um you know uh top gun town and right. so uh it really it, i actually maintain it is the last <laughs> 70 and i really mean that mm-hmm. and it's for everything we were just talking about and we'll talk about in that it has some there's a shorthand people use that it's it's got a european more european sensibility you mm-hmm. could say that and sure. it's also a very modern film that's something that paul and kale said we can talk about that later but it's um it's uh it's challenging audiences with um absolutely no tropes and cliches of uh of the, the mechanisms of film you know right. what i mean and and that's exactly. a very, that's a tenant that's a tenant of 70s hollywood films and boy it was gone by 82. Yeah. Right. Gone. Yeah. So let's. Um, so how did that happen? So let's get there. Yeah. Let's just yeah. Uh, get it. I'm gonna, uh, Ramey. I'm gonna set it up for you just in terms of talking about Robert Town, uh, who's the director of yeah. this film, but he's most notably uh, a, a screenwriter and script doctor. And um, just to sort of give you a sense uh, for, for the listeners, the one fucking hours out there, there's a lot just in looking at Robert Town's filmography. I mean, uh, I guess I'll sort of explain it, mentioning the titles. How about that, this? You're a, if you never heard that name. You're a fan, though, even if you right. never heard of yeah. it. Right, you right. are a fan of this man. Well, let's uh, let's list some of the films that he's involved with that could be future one fucking hour episodes. That's kind of the best way to describe mm. him. Okay, mm-hmm. you got Chinatown, which maybe he's most noticed, uh, most notable for. You have uh, he won an Oscar. For that. Yeah, won an Oscar for that. Uh, you, you have The Godfather. Uh, oh, how about script one fucking doctoring. yeah, script doctoring, of course. How about one the fucking last detail. Hour? I was just going to say that. You took it out of my mouth. Sorry. One fucking hour oh, on the last know. detail. How about that? Sure. How about sure. Cisco Pike? How about McCabe yeah. and Mrs. Oh, Miller? Holy funge. Oh, yeah. How about <laughs> holy fungible? <laughs> and, uh, and maybe a little, uh, a little prescient. How about one fucking hour in Parallax View? I could see that maybe. Oh, I love oh. that film. I would do that mm-hmm. in a heartbeat. Yeah. And I think on, on the right day and in the right mood, I could totally see. He's uncredited on this one, but... That I think we can get a fucking hour out of Tough Guys Don't Dance. I don't know about you guys, but I could. Yeah, you you, you shortlisted <laughs> that title before. Yeah, and I think that'd be. Yeah. So he also he was involved in like Bonnie and Clyde. I mean, yeah, uh, Bonnie and Clyde. In, in flipping that film from just sort of like some typical Hollywood fare, he's one of the one of the creative forces that made it what it is. You know, so so, so he's a real, he's a powerhouse. Yeah. He's powerhouse. a powerhouse. Yes. And it took him all this time to. Uh, you know, helm uh, and get behind the screen, uh, get behind the camera. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we were just saying that, um, uh, you know, uh, it's one of the last 70s films. It was star- it was greenlit and it was started in 79 and it had a terrible, uh, you know, one of those cursed well, histories. There was a, well, yeah. So I was just going to say, I, I, I think, say. I think Ramey's got the 411 on that. Wait, should we, I was going to say, should I explain the, kind of the story of how we got the idea for the film? Yes, please. Yeah, is yeah. That, that all, the whole story. Okay. 
Okay, cool. So, so he's working at UCLA in the late seventies. Um, and I don't know whether he's like teaching a class or whatnot there. Um, and he's working out in the gym and he's swimming and doing all the stuff. He's in the workout room all the time. And he tells a story that he's lifting these weights and he's like, damn, you know, it's like overwhelming. He looks over and he sees this person like going crazy on these weights. He's like, Whoa, I really, really envy that guy. And then like a minute later turns around and it's a woman and he walks up to her and is like, wow, you know, that's, that's super impressive. And it ends up being Jane, a uh, woman named Jane F- uh, Frederick, who at the time was like the, the leading track and field star wow. Olympian who was like, she was like the, probably besides like Billie Jean King, like probably the most hmm. iconic female athlete at that moment. Oh. And so he was fascinated and, and her whole thing was being a pantathlete. So it was like the hurdling, the, all the stuff they're doing in personal best. They wow. struck up a conversation and then he became like fascinated with this subject and mm-hmm. they start hanging out and she starts telling him stories about like what it's, what her journey has been like, what it's like to be a woman of this time period doing this. She introduces him to a bunch of her friends who are also athletes and Olympians. Yeah. One of them being Patrice Donnelly, who ends up being wow. cast as Tori. Wow. So then he says, I want to make a movie about this. And basically they, they all collaborated on the script together, which is pretty interesting that he's like such an iconic screenwriter. Mm -hmm. He, his main thing with doing this project was I want this to be as most, the most authentic piece of work about this topic I can do. So I want to bring in you guys. I want the real experiences. I want the experts. I want to film in Eugene or Oregon, which is the epicenter, the Mecca basically of track and field in the world. And so what's cool about it, it's, it's really specific. Like he wasn't like, I'm just making a movie about female athletes or or he was like, I'm making a movie about female athletes training for the, olympics in eugene oregon specifically like wow so it's like it's like he's delving into this like really unique similar subculture and he's getting the insiders to give him that personal journey and so P- patrice donnelly ended up actually giving a lot of her personal life in the um into the character of chris so like her being part native american in the story that's that's from patrice's mm-hmm. background she had a really difficult relationship with her father that's from her background mm-hmm. so like th- she was actually had a really intense friendship in her you know teammates that she had to compete with so all of that stuff is coming so from, you're saying from that um uh the mariel hemingway character is largely based on the woman who plays her um you know her uh, her partner in the film yes um, wow, exactly. i did not know that that's very cool yeah. I, I, I need so to rewatch it also. <laughs> yeah, so that's so. There, there, I you know? just wanted to wow, I love that. a little bit of that. You know, and, if I can't, so oh, just just no, a total please. aside because you're yeah, talking yeah, about yeah. this and it's making me think. You know, this whole like it's the last film of the '70s, and I think one thing that's really interesting is to think about with Robert Town is that he's an extremely Southern California person, meaning he mm. doesn't have that New York uh, in his oh, bloodstream. Yeah. Even sure. people who transplanted to Hollywood later. They're like New York in the, you know, with famous people like Scorsese and all that. But just like he is the strictly California person. And what I'm getting at is as the seven, as the, as we leave the sixties and go in and through the seventies, the, the body becomes so significant health foods, totally and working out. And some might say it's, it's strictly a narcissistic endeavor. Like I want to look good when I'm not wearing a shirt, you know, that kind of thing. But I think it's something else. And I think that this film, what I'm getting at is this film is not the most verbal, not the most dialogue driven film. Exactly. It's, it's really about physicality, the body yep. and, 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 and understanding these women through their bodies. I know it sounds gross and stupid, but it's really not, that's not it. And people have done those kinds of things, but it's, it's, and also um, expression through the body. Yeah. And I find that really fascinating. And again, very singular in, uh, and especially strange because uh, Pauline Kael said, um, we can talk about that more later, but that uh, it's surprising that um, usually writers who make their first film as director, you know, it's chatty. It's like bah, 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 yeah. more than ever. But um, it's it's really such a nonverbal film, and that's one of the very striking things about it. And I think there's something about the significance of the human body, and specifically the female human body, and yeah. not in male gaze, cornball boredom at all, but no. in this really strange, unique way. And that really resonated with me. You know, um, yeah, that's just, like the landscape of the film is like the female form, especially one that's an athletic one that's in like yeah. supreme condition. 
And so just thoughts on that. Right. Well, just just yeah. ju- just to underline that what you're saying to go back to that you know sort of emblematic scene we were talking about the sort of first date sequence we were talking about uh, at the top mm-hmm. of the show. It's like it kind of sets all that up too. It like sets the expectation of like like I don't mean to sound like the crass teenager in the room, but like you know you are seeing the 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 functions of the body like you know you have you like see our, our main character farting and she's a woman you're not going to see that in yeah, most movies true, true. you know like you're, you know and, yeah. and, and and like you see that but then you know in in all the sequences when you know she's working out you know and i actually had to check myself a little bit because it was like there's that scene where she's doing the uh, she's like doing the bench pressing and it's like shot like right up her crotch, you know? And it's like, right. but I, I think that's a deliberate choice to do that still to show the physicality of that, not to be yeah. sexual yeah. or to be, you know what yeah. I mean? Like he is really, sh- yeah. and, and of course, and of course, jumping back to the first date scene, the idea of the arm wrestling, how it is silent. It's not chatty. It says everything you need to know about that sequence of just them staring at each other, trying to get this. No fierce, music. No music. Yeah, no music. Yeah. Of them trying to win it's, it's, this arm wrestling moment. It's such an yeah. incredible moment in the movie. Yeah. Sorry, Remy. How about pain? It's interesting. Too? Pain is, pain is huge. Like, it, and I really I feel it. Oh, okay. Go yeah, for it. Yeah. And, and that's, um, no, because that's literally like when Robert Town is, was asked, like, what this is about, he, he like, literally, it's about, it's about pain and excellence. Oh, wow. And like, and, and, and to me, it's like, it's very like spiritual. Like it's very, like, it's about like sacrifice mm-hmm. and it's like a trend, like it's about like transcending, right? It's Absolutely. like you're using, you're giving your life, you're giving yourself and your body is becoming this like in service of something else almost like mm-hmm. you're like, so like to be an Olympian, right? Like you're sacrificing the chance to be a man to become a God, right? Like you're giving up being a man to become a God. Right. Wow. And like to, to do that, like you, you can't be human anymore. Like you can't be fallible. You can't have loves. You can't have like your mental health intact. Like you can't have um, neurosis. Sure. No. Right. You're, you're, you have a singular goal and you're, yeah, your body becomes a machine to be marveled at. And I mm-hmm. think he does a really beautiful job in the movie of presenting. The, obviously we talk about the slow-mo. We talk about like, you know, we'll talk about that later, but like the close-ups of yeah, the, the body, parts, like you are supposed to be fetishizing this. Like it, he, when, right. when he met the bodybuilder, female athlete, he was fetishizing it, but that's not, that, that's not a negative thing. Like that's what this movie's about. It's we're, we're, the fact that we have Olympians in our culture is sort of fascinating. Like we are fetishizing Look, the human. Yeah. yeah. Look, these are powerful women. I think one of the distinctions is, when it's the boring male gaze thing of like, look at those boobs or whatever in a movie. <laughs> um, like it's, uh, they, they, they're not given any power. Even sexual power is debatable because it's like always in the context of like male desirability. But this is like exhibitions of power, <laughs> you know? Uh, of, yeah. of, but it's not just physical power, like I can bench press, but it's what you're saying. It's I have this incredible mental power. Mental. Endurance, because yeah. that's how you get to the transcendent point that you're describing, right? And uh, you do, you don't, you know. Yeah. And um, you know, as you try, so I think there's just there's just too much power happening with the women, and it's by the way also a power that the women have that's not based on like their checkbook or like um, right. more mo- modern, um, yeah, uh, re- true like capitalist. Co- it's not co- qualifiers, yeah. you know. Like I'm a CEO, I'm a powerful woman. It's much more. Um, it's much more, uh, um, it's deeper. I and, and, I, and I think, and like you said, once again, like the idea of pain, I want to come back to the idea too of like fear, yeah. but, but pain is like, it's like, if it is an inside look into like how these people live their lives, it's showing that like every day is pain. It's like the massages oh, and the, the steam rooms and the, like you're breaking your, you know, you're spraining your ankle. You're, you're screaming. Blood, yeah. You're <laughs> screaming in pain. Blood curdling like, screams. And you're fighting past that. And it's, it's like, and what's interesting is like the, they bring up this question a lot in the movie. They talk about like kind of what is it for? Like the idea of winning is brought up often. Like yeah, and there's yeah, these really, really. cool, segments where they talk about there's like vo there's moments where like she's having the date with a swimmer and it's like okay so you won the gold medal but like what does it mean yeah, and yeah. there's there's a, there's also like the threat was it of worth emptiness it? once you do yeah it was it worth it and yeah. and so it's really a movie about like it's about process because at the end of the day it, it, there is sort of emptiness in the gold it really is yeah, the yeah. process of getting there and then that's like what we're seeing as an audience well, how about and then just on the other yeah. oh sorry yeah no, no, no. Ahead, I'll, I'll just add on to that real quick and I'll tag you back in. But how about the idea of like, 
in this whole movie, it's all about the tryouts. You know, it's not really yeah, about I getting the gold. That. And hang on, it's not right. just That's about amazing. getting the gold, but let's not also forget what happened in the Olympics that year too. Uh, and it's a very brief mention yeah. womp, in the womp. movie. Womp, womp, womp. At the end of the movie when they're, yeah, she makes the team, but uh, too bad for her. They're not going to be packing their bags at all because there's they're no all dressed up and nowhere Olympics. to go. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Olympics were canceled. Yeah. Because of uh, the, and that's perfect. And well, that because, was because of the inva- the Soviets invaded uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. It was the Moscow Summer Olympics. Right. Which so is Carter a, said, uh, "We're yeah. out." Which is a perfect dramatic thing for this movie because it's kind of like it it, it. it it further takes it to be about the process of what they're going through and not the end yeah. result. It's the journey. Yeah, that's not a good the point. Destination. Yeah. It's you know the film does not end. Uh, at the Olympics, it, 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 it yeah. couldn't. It just doesn't, and it couldn't. You know, but that's even of kind reality. of better. Yeah. No, that's totally yeah. cool. And I think, did I? Um, nobody. Uh, one of our characters does comes in fifth on the trials. Right. You know, yeah. but it's okay to speak to what we're saying. Yeah. Because you, because well, and also just to really get into this whole concept, just briefly. Well, one second um, before we do. It's a competition with yourself as much as anything. Too. Yeah. Exactly. Right. exactly. But that's what really matters. You know. It's but a I did. Yourself, yeah. But I did step on you, Ramy. I, I totally stepped right. on you, though, Ramy. Did you? Uh, did you? When I was stepping on um, you about. Oh, I just was going to also quickly say about just like being a female athlete at the time. I think when you watch right. us as a, a modern audience, we kind of take it for granted that there were women athletes and women Olympians. But at the time, the seventies was right. really that point where that even became something that was possible. Right. Like, and, and we were talking about briefly earlier. There was the legislation that was passed, Title IX. That was basically one of the things that that did was it it it, it fixed the loophole so that um, colleges were funded for female sports, which which never happened before. Wow. If you were a woman, you basically weren't allowed to play sports. You know, you, they would say like, "Oh, you might get hysteria, or you might have your period, and it would ruin." Like it was like you was it was totally an anomaly. Usual. So like there was a whole movement about like women's right to play sports, and the seventies ushered that in. And this movie is actually a period piece. Because it was filmed in the late 70s, but set in 1976. It starts in 1976. Love that. And so it's sort of interesting because it's like this very specific moment in time where you're seeing the golden age of female athleticism come into the, the first wave. Time. The first wave. The yeah, first that's wave. interesting. I hadn't yeah. thought of that. And you're right. It's true. Now it's much more common. Like, um, I mean, every other commercial is now like a, a woman, you know, and like uh, running and like yoga pants with like you know bottled uh, sports water you know what i mean that's that's yeah. the, no no it's true it's so typical of uh, in the modern landscape it was fine i'm just saying like, it, <laughs> like it this was a, the anomaly the, an, yeah the absolutely outcome. and you were in like talking about like bra- yeah bravery and all that shit and female wow, yeah. and whatever this was this really was because like you were jeered at you were stigmatized people already called you a lesbian like right, uh, like course. so it's like it's interesting because these people were like they went outside of the lines like they were living on the margins making this choice and so it's some it's an article i read about patrice donnelly she said that this movie resonated and what she wanted to contribute to the screenplay was that like women at the time actually needed much more of a sisterhood and that's why even the relationship that they became become romantic it's really just like a deep 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 intimacy it's yeah it's sexual it's romantic it's everything and like at the time like they, she was saying that like you needed that support because like the support was not coming anywhere else so like you kind of created this dynamic with your teammates where you were a mentor you were a trainer you were a coach you were the person to cry on each other's shoulder it's just you, nothing else your family's there was, gone there was nothing else yeah yeah you know? wow. and and so i think like that the movie like i think it's cool hmm. for people to go in watching this with a little context because like yeah. something that me and Evan were saying to when we were watching it's interesting because it's the opposite of didactic but to almost to a point where like you're kind of vague sometimes about like what year is this where are they like what like, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't hair it's very loose in a beautiful way Right. But it doesn't hammer anything home. So it's like, it is kind of cool, I think, to go in a little bit and be like, okay, that's the context. That's what we're yeah. looking at here. Like, yeah, you know, sure. it's interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it fleshed it out for me. I, I didn't really put it in any particular well, context. But, and, and also just you're helping because we're all so used to, again, female athletes in modern times. And they just were probably mainly more freaks. Like, why would you want to do that? Like, you know, it's like, yeah. like, like their husbands or boyfriends would be like, Ew, you know, like also there, it's more female empowerment, and independence, you know, and going for hers, which was, you know, not as in vogue then too, you know, so, but all these things yeah. have rolled over in 40 years, you know, very different. Yeah. It is a snapshot of a time. I think snapshot. we should also, it's, it's totally, 
I think we should also touch on as we're talking about you know the context of this movie too, and you mentioned it at the top near the top of the show about um, you know um, Patrice Donnelly this sort of being semi autobiographical the fact that she is a you know track star uh, of that time a non actor you know someone who never non actor somebody who exactly. had no acting chops and stepped into this role and does a tremendous job as Tori. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, incredible. I remember first seeing the movie and being like, what else has she been in? Her performance you know? is amazing. I love her performance. Yeah. It's and it's, it's really, I, and Tom, you were saying before we were recording, we were just like, don't you just love it when a non-actor just kills it? And I, and I do, I yeah. mean, like this is, this is really, hang S. Nor. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking hang S. Nor. Right. <laughs> the killing fields. <laughs> <laughs> That's my boy. Amazing. Uh, no, no, it's, sometimes it doesn't work, and when it does work, it's amazing. You know, sometimes like, it doesn't work, but it, it can work. I guess it's the eye of the director. You know, like um, he saw that. I'm assuming that Town had a certain talent where he's like, um, "That's not like I'm not picking them randomly out of a lineup and yeah. saying, yeah, well, let's go with uh, her.' No, like he saw no. and probably interacting with her, talking with her that." she could probably handle this. You know, so they right became though. friends. Uh, I, like this could be a good segue to, to talk a little bit about like the production because there's so, so much wild shit with the production. So much. But, um, and I, then let's I, shout out Marielle Hemingway too after this. Yeah. Too. So I've, I've been reading Marielle Hemingway's uh, memoir oh. and it's, it's cool because in the memoir, she talks a lot about personal best because um, it was very formative because it was, you know, like we said, she did lipstick, but she was a little kid. Basically she did Manhattan, which was a big deal. And mm -hmm. then this was the movie after Manhattan where she was like, this is my chance to kind of like do an adult role. And she fought for this role. I thought was really cool. Mm -hmm. Like she read the script. It was floating around and she was like, I want this. And town wasn't like set on her. was like, oh, I'm not sure I want all athletes. And he thought he was literally going to hire all athletes. Oh. And she was like, I can do this. Yeah, which is in, kind of insane. But I did hear a, that she trained for 18 months. She did. And, and, and how so old she, was she? she? Grew up, how well, old was she? she was, this? I think she was 19, 20. 20. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. 19 turning 20. Um, wow. But she was a skier. She'd been skiing her whole life. Supposedly, mm. she'd been like training on the trampolina. She was a very athletic person. And so she said, listen, I can do this and I'll train. And she did. She trained for, an, uh, for a year. Um, and then in her memoir, she talks about the set. And basically that Patrice Donnelly and Robert Town were having an affair during the filming of this movie. And they were so at night she would go home with Robert Town, Patrice, and then in the morning would come in. And Meryl said that every morning on set, like she would come in, like just like kind of like just stressed, like just like. Huh. like just like in an emotional state and and meryl thought it was like fascinating and she was like okay he's doing a lot of work on her basically at night when we go home and like i know that's work not that meaning I mean, maybe, she, yeah hello what are you talking know, about? i'm sure various various types of work but <laughs> okay. but like so you know because she's no, but like psychological break yes, psychological or? shit yeah because right. she's, not a, she's, she's not an actor so it's like right, it's right. like in a way i mean you know like he was doing that stuff when they got home like the personal stuff and then she'd come up like on set oh, wow. okay. and you can see that in her performance i mean she's like there's a pain there that's probably from her own personal life mixed with that's it's so authentic wow. you know and and so right. another thing on that point which is pretty interesting is that um scott Glenn, Glenn, Ooh. yeah, Scott Jack Glenn. Glenn was also Shout talking out. about the idea of, I mean, also yeah. amazing. We got to talk about him, but, but he yeah. plays the, the coach and like the coach's role is very similar to a film director's role with their actors. I know. I was thinking about that. Right. They have the, and, and, breaking, and breaking him down. And Scott Glenn said, I, I'm a proxy for Robert town. Basically I'm sort of playing Robert Jeez. town in this film. And like, Yowzy. so the way that he's, he's like, you know, the athletic coach, it's like, you're so many things, but like you're, you're huh. constantly manipulating. You know what I mean? Like you're right. manipulating, but for a goal, it's not like manipulation just for the sake of it. Like you yeah. have a goal in mind Ego and or something. Yeah. We'll, we'll do whatever you can to do that. Yeah. Right, you're, 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 By the way, you're, side note, total side note, Jack Nicholson was the intended yeah uh intended oh. as, as that yeah, yeah, yeah wow yeah, yeah. Scott, he, he just down. he just was like no thanks <laughs> yeah no, but Scott, yeah amazing it would have been a different film it totally oh 100 it would have been all about him it would have he would have been on the poster yeah, of course know, it's sort of like it's trying to steal it, 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 it actually would have been about it actually would have been about like can this uh can this coach get these women under control um but anyway yeah, uh, yeah. scott you would have steered it wrong no scott glenn's perfect time let's do it 
Okay, sorry. He's he's perfect. It's a good segue, but it is such a complicated character because you're right. It is kind of the role of a director because in this movie, he's uh, the girl's mentor. He's also their sadist, pushing pushing them beyond yeah. their physical limits. Yeah, yeah. He's their cheerleader. He's their literally their biggest fan. You know, he plays all of this. But what I love about even though there is kind of a slight triangle going on, I won't say love triangle, but there's a little bit of a triangle going on between Scott Glenn and Marywell Hemingway and Tori and all that stuff. Um, but what I do like too is, and I think what makes this movie feel modern and ahead of its time, even ahead of what you would see today, is the fact that he doesn't care that they're gay. He knows what's going on, but it, it, it doesn't even give it any air, you know, at all. And, and normally in a movie that... He's would- not coming up with this prudent, moralistic... Right uh, thing, but he no. but he is not into their relationship because uh, it cuts off their killer instinct. Of exactly. course, he loses right. two women right. through one relationship, right. and they're they're going to get softened up and like lose right. their priorities, right. you know. And he says that essentially in certain scenes, like, "Hey, well, let me guess what you're thinking about. You, know, you think about her, you know, that kind of thing." <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's not moralizing. Yeah, exactly. Scott Glenn, two seconds. Mm-hmm. He had just also done Urban Cowboy. Yeah most horrifying scary asshole ever yeah. he's like the bad guy in urban cowboy yeah. and uh beating up on deborah winger it's rough shit it and is. he gets some of that creep vibe in in this film too uh in one scene with mariel and uh he's a real powerhouse you know yeah. mm-hmm. and, also, and, him? and then the right stuff well he he's sure. great in the right stuff right oh yeah and mm-hmm. then um sounds it's funny because Silence of the Lambs got that with Clarice a little bit. He's got the oh yeah, the, yeah you know, he does a tough mentor, but yeah. So big um, shouts to Scott. Another thing that's interesting about like the making of the film too, I wanted to point out. I don't know if you guys knew this, but there was three cinematographers, mm-hmm. um, and obviously the cinematographers like that's a pretty important aspect of this because so much of what makes this movie amazing and captivating. It's, and when we first saw it, we're like, whoa. No, well, there's th- those guys crazy. were '70s film rock stars. The yeah, cinematography yeah. is notable, and you've got Michael Chapman is one of them, right? And he, yeah, he was uh, his big up was on a Taxi Driver, among other things. And Raging Bull, yeah, yeah. And then um, and then Caleb Dashnall, who's Zoe Dashnall's dad, um, was the other cinematographer who supposedly was responsible for the slow mo stuff. And he directed. So it's, it's really a lot which, of Twin Peaks episodes so he, too, right? That's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sick. Okay. So he he directed. Oh, sorry. He uh, was a cinematographer for the right stuff as well, which is amazing. And then the Black Stallion and the Black Stallion. Oh, it's so yeah. funny because at the time, yeah, the Black Stallion. Like people really like regarded that very highly. Um, I love that movie, but it's there's slow motion. A lot of the horses. Sure. Running, it's really be- beautifully course, shot. Yeah. And um, and so it's funny. I was reading stories about like like uh, who uh, who was it? Oh, Michael Chapman and Town were constantly fighting. Like supposedly on set, it was like insanity. They were yelling at each other like the entire time about like yeah. which lenses to use. And and Town's like, I want long lenses. And Chapman's like, well, that's <laughs> insane. And you know, like well, if I can interject, a, yeah. Oh, I see. That's why the other two guys were getting involved. Uh, but if I can interject, um, what I had heard was that Chapman's his his biggest pet peeve is a director who can't make a decision and he is quoted on the record as saying that guy always got me because he can't make a fucking decision this was his first film you know so uh you know a town's first film so he what I have heard is that he was running around like a chicken with its head cut off because he was I mean to go from just writing stuff down on a piece of paper to all the mechanical logistic stuff of a director yeah, yeah right. I, I do think he was underwater a lot and it probably got someone like chapman to get really exacerbated um or uh, you know exasperated and so um but <laughs> just if i can a little dirt on this whole backstory of making the film mm-hmm. um yeah. you know it, this is a 70s film right so of course there's an enormous amount of blow cane yes. everywhere <laughs> and robert town evidently had the best stuff so he was blowed out every day and it was um drugs drink and women um all the time so this was there's a big uh, hardcore professional partier of malibu beach making that film so that probably didn't help things either but it's a it's great it's great that he made a good film out of it you know yeah but it's so funny and i think it added to the film and it's the film's weird energy like kind of laconic energy it has because it, it kept on getting shut down so there initially right. what happened was there was this the SAG and I think the Writers Guild strike. 
So then, so then the film was getting shut down. He was trying to argue with them saying, no, 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 this shouldn't qualify for that. Cause of this reason I had to sign up all these athletes and blah, blah. They're like, no, mm-hmm. fuck that. We're shooting, shutting it down. So he went out to find funding and that's what, how David Geffen, the record producer got involved. So he went out to David Geffen and was like, I gotta, I gotta give you the money for this blah, blah. So he gave, right. gives him the money, but then they start fighting the whole time. Cause then he's, yeah, Robert Towns doing blow the whole time constantly rewriting it so all the actresses and the actors and the people the athletes are just like oh my god they're sitting around it's supposed to be six weeks it turns into six months it just keeps on going right. you imagine so Meryl like Hemingway, professional athletes professional athletes yeah. being led by a coke head <laughs> such a weird, <laughs> such a weird dynamic insane. sorry go ahead no but, but so Meryl Hemingway said strange. that like it lent to the vibe of them all becoming this like community and really becoming okay. It was like a method situation. They really became those people. They were living that. Got it. They wow. all became in this community. They were athletes, but they were also very frustrated. So well, it's like it, 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 the film has this like this painful. Because you were saying, yeah, yeah. you were saying it was a, it was supposed to be six months production, or sorry, six, six weeks, weeks productions, and it yeah. became six months. Yeah, right? and then it kind of yeah things kept on happening where it was, mm. and then and the production would pause and re- start again. And again, yeah. the film starts. Wow. And, the production is in 79. This yeah. is released in 82. So that just kind of says everything. And then right. that's also one of the reasons. Uh, that's another reason why they had three cinematographers. Because like then mm. one of them wanted uh, another job. And then that's right, also right, interesting right. because the course, film, the film has yeah. a bizarre texture to it. And oh, I wanted to also say the um, kind of mm. what we're talking about like the, uh, uh, the Lenny uh, Riefenstahl stuff. Well, so, right. I, let me set this up because yes. I, I, I just I just want to uh, just because we're getting to the 20 minute mark here. Okay. Um, Unbelievable. I know we're all we got 21 minutes left. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to just set up the, the fact that what makes from a technical point of view, this movie really fun to watch and really mm-hmm. visually beautiful to watch is mm-hmm. all of the slow motion sports. And, you know, yeah. if, if, if you're going to make a sports movie out there, folks, you got to have lots of slow mo. That's like number one um and this movie <laughs> has plenty of it and it's amazing because we were going back we were talking about this film being the the you know like true depiction of the human form of of the female form and i think that the, uh, what better way to do it than the over usage of slow motion and especially how heightened sound design which we'll talk about as well too but yes. uh it's so good in terms of just great sports slow-mo shit and i and i have to imagine that you know that this is uh, or that he was inspired from many different sources for that i'm guessing to you know, in order to use that or maybe the cinematographers were but you yeah, were sort of i don't know i wonder i yeah. no sorry finish that well, i was just gonna say maybe was it like because i know you're mentioning lenny riefenstahl but was yeah. there any other sort of or is well, that they, it they that's they keep every article i've read which uh, they they cite her that movie so which like one? in so it was a 1936 uh documentary I say that in quotes because it's like there's discussion whether it was like a Nazi propaganda film or whether it's a documentary, but it's basically Lenny Riefenstahl is uh, doing a beautiful black and white film about the 1936 uh, Olympics. Uh, Olympiad, I think. Yeah, right? yeah, and and it was in two parts, and one of them, and and it's 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 basically it's like these one of them opens with like these Greek statues turning into you know the the athletes and then it's in slow motion and it's all of the you know the pentathletes and their swimmers yeah. and the hurdlers and it's all the slow motion but she revolutionized a lot of those filmmaking techniques that's why people regard it as like one of the most formative movies of all time right yeah. because it was so unprecedented to, to have those kind of techniques in representing you know documentation of sports Completely. i'll just add one tiny side note that will have a payoff at the end of this episode, but <laughs> I became I became an Olympics documentary expert at some point in my life. I love and it. there's one film in particular, okay? It's called Visions of Eight. It's very obscure, but it, it was known in the 70s. I think it got an Oscar nomination, but it's simply this. It's eight directors, mm-hmm. but like hard, strident, avant-garde directors. Like, you know, like- um, Yeah, who like are just they? Really, uh, we can, we'll look it up, but I think okay. one of the most famous is Milos Forman. How about that? Wow. Yeah, May Zetterling, for all you May Zetterling fans out there, <laughs> she has a moment. But anyway, it's very cool, and it's 1970. It, well, it's the 72 Olympics made in, and then come out in 73 or whatever, and like it has tons of slow motion. The shit is dripping in slow motion. There's one. What's the one where you have to go really high and and, and go over the bar? The, the high jump? Or, high jump? Sorry, high jump. High jump. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, the high jump. There's one of the eight segments by with one of the eight directors. It's only that. An excruciating slow motion because it's like oh, yeah. is he 
going to hit more? <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It looks like he's, it looks like outer space, like floating. It's incredible. That's awesome. So maybe, maybe the cinematographers saw that because um, yeah. it is a striking film, but almost all the others, there's a, a Tokyo Olympiad from 64. I was going to say, and also similar techniques, you know, I was going to say that, yeah, uh, Tokyo Olympiad, uh, probably on the Criterion channel, Kony Chikawa, you know, that movie also mm, has a lot sick. of stylistic flourishes and amazing sick. If, if you like Olympic shit, check that out. Yeah. And if you like slow motion, check that shit out. Yeah. <laughs> and if you like both, you're, you're insane. <laughs> you're, but anyway, just to, th- th- this is a valid conversation about like um, uh, this great stylistic choice that they use. But also, I'll, I'll, I'll lead you into this, Evan. Please. Um, there's the slow mo that we know and love, and I've seen in other Olympics docu- or Olympic documentaries. The slow mo is great, but there's an added component the town added, which is to the for the ears. Yeah. Yes, Next exactly. Level. And that is so fucking great. There's an amazing scene in the film. I want to say it's kind of smack dab in the middle. It's the scene where um, Tori and Chris are jogging up the sand dune hill, and it's absolutely yeah. amazing because and it's a great creative choice because um, Robert Towns like or whoever's dis- uh, decision it was, let's get some stockhausen like crazy like avant you know sound design in this to really heighten it and for any aspiring filmmaker listening to the show if you want to make a movie that's one way to take nothing and to elevate it into yeah. the cosmos yeah. is it, you, you know what it is to, yeah it's 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 70s movies had prog rock moves yes sometime you know yeah. what i'm saying and this yeah, is a totally. perfect example of a hardcore prog rock move yeah also um another thing is exact like there's um sound sound sonics you know electronic music but there's also things like um uh amplifying and adding echo to heavy breathing yeah that's amazing i love that thickness so it's like the heavy breathing and then you can hear their foot like the footstep yeah like like the isolated foleying of it yeah on the track on the sand of the track and then hulk running and there's no music it's fucking awesome no but it's yeah yeah, no music I, and I just want to say, I don't want to get too off topic, but just the idea of constructing a scene of two girls running up a hill and you're able to give it so much weight and so much elevation by yeah. just paying, just by slowing that shit down and adding yep. some unearthly crazy sound yep. over it. And I just want to like, you know, you don't see that anymore today, but I but I will nope. shout out this movie real quick. Side note, don't want to get too off track. This movie, Cresha, Uh-oh. from a few years back which yeah. you know was just about a family getting together for Thanksgiving and there'd be these ominous shots of the turkey in the oven slow motion <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. and wow. that's okay. the fucking way to do it you can take anything and elevate it with that trick yeah. so yeah. this movie does yeah. it fucking perfectly so, so. and it seems like so last like, 70s I, I, film I, I maintain I, yeah. I told you I, I got this I'll, can you see that if I put that yeah it's good that? Uh, move it around a little because it's glaring. a little glary like, just like kind of there you go yes okay no. This is a, yes. No, yes. No. Okay. Yes. So I, I, this runner magazine is is amazing, and it, it's got a great. Uh, we can, yeah, well, we can we can post some stuff and scan it, but um, yeah, it's uh, he he. Ta- it's all like behind the scenes stuff, but he talks so much about. Oh, what's that? Is that your Lenny Riefenstahl playing? That Lenny Riefenstahl uh, ringtone. <laughs> <laughs> that is oh my god! <laughs> Turn that off. We're gonna get uh, <laughs> shut down. Um, yeah, by the bot. So yeah, I know. My, the, the Nazi soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. Um, Warner Chapel's gonna like. Uh, yeah. you know, yeah. So, exactly. I'm sorry. So I'm sorry about that. But but so anyway, the the movement thing is like he talks about so much. Where he's like, okay, film is pri- usually primarily about yeah talking and dialogue or action. Yeah. And he's like, what if you made it about sound and movement? instead of talking and action Fuck yeah mm, and so yeah, he's, yeah, he's like all you need to know all human beings are it's like if you it is their movement and like the the feeling of that like he was saying like when you when you slow like tori down when she's about to like throw that shit and you see that in her face the shot put on her face like he was like it's like someone that's about to get basically executed that's what he said like it's like Mm. watching the 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 intensity Mm. of that if you slow that shit down and you have authentic performers everything you need to know is on their faces and in their bodies like like the true instrument of a performer or athlete it's all in their body you know it's not about the words. it's a profound and it's a profound portrayal of of human existence you know right. like without exactly. any f- uh, fabrication you know yeah, on anyone's no part fabrication. yeah um 
But back, like, it, so I think we maybe if we can touch a little bit about the cultural impact. You, you talked about the Pauline Kael yeah. piece. So there, so at the time too, there was a lot of like feminist film theory, film scholars. That that was like 1970s, 1975. It was like the Laura Mulvey, like male gaze, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. All those essays were coming out. A lot of like, so this was kind of like a formative moment for like all of that discussion to happen. So I think when this came out, it, it, I, it was interesting going back and reading with that criticism because uh, because it's so much about the gaze, slowing that down and, right. and kind of like fetishizing that. Yeah. There, at the time, there was a bit of a backlash but then there was an interesting dichotomy where there's a writer who was a film scholar named Linda Williams and she wrote an essay in a publication it was called Jump Cut. I can send it to you guys. It's pretty cool. But but yeah, she yeah, basically yeah. kind of breaking this down and how th there there is a discussion of like some people were very turned off because they felt it was a misogynistic, you know, lens that we we're looking through and we're looking at their crotches as they're, you know, doing right. high jump. And, right. and she said something that was interesting is like when she said, you know, it's something to to think about and talk about it. But at the same time, when she broke down the difference between the film critics, besides Siskel and Ebert, a majority of the male critics are the ones who were most offended by it. And the female critics, and there's, I have a, a lot of them that I, that I pulled, and the mm -hmm. female critics were really, really, like kind of excited and thrilled by mm. seeing imagine. female bodies portrayed in this way. And the fact that right. like, it looked like they had autonomy and they had all right. of these nuances and strength and this emotional range that right. we hadn't seen in movies for a long, forever, you know? So right. like the women are like, fuck yeah, cool. Like, I don't care if I'm seeing her vagina, like vaginas are awesome. And, and her arms That's are That's not awesome really the point awesome. necessarily. That's not the point. It's not it's like not one point. for one. It's like, like, exactly. like a female body part doesn't have to equate in a lurid way sexuality or in a, um, you know, like a, right. a, a knee jerk yeah. reaction, anti lurid, you know, it's like, like, it's still in, in it's, it's a, to, to critique sexualizing and sexualizing are dancing together. Yeah. And, and it, it, uh, and it, it, it's it in the eye of, of the beholder. Like, yeah. you know, like it's in the eye of the beholder and that's what's so interesting because like it's, I mean, we can talk about this in loops forever about like what lens we're looking through. But yeah, mm -hmm. if you're a man and you're a male critic and you watch that, maybe your first reaction is, and this is totally natural. Oh my God, I'm looking at a girl's crotch over and over. And then you have a feeling and then you feel uncomfortable. You say, oh my God, this is misogynistic. Whereas right. from another perspective, you watch it and you say, well, I see all of these body parts, but I also see the emotion and I see the whole person. And, and it's all the body parts. Like, yeah, like all the body there's, some, there's some real hot knee action, you know, <laughs> lots of knees, it's like, lots like of there's, knees. there's, I think that's part of it. Uh, not Farting. defensive, but like as an example, yes. sure. And, and but just as an example of, um, you know, like, like there's all kinds of parts of female bodies. It's not like a mm -hmm. woman is made up of breasts and ass. It's like, like in this <laughs> film, it's like, just like, it's, it's an entire uh, organism, you know, yeah. and, it's, yeah. and that's and what like, this is about, like, you know, and there's yeah. a context for it and it's all about like what that takes right. emotionally in the same way we would watch like the last dance or we watch something where we're like marveling at this phenomena that human beings can do these yeah. things, can do these bodies. things, you know, yeah. we're watching it and it's okay to watch. Well, that's we look at male. Well, that's the thing. It's like, it's the, the boy girl thing. It's like, because everyone's conditioned to look at like, you know, beautiful uh, male athletes, like in the Olympics, you know, yeah. like uh, right. runners legs and all that yeah. stuff. But like, but like, like, yeah, but I, I will say this and maybe I think Pauline Kael, one of the female critics got into this a little bit was there is a sexuality to it. Yeah, that's you know that, what I mean? Yeah, that does, you know, but it's but it's just in a different or it's in a yeah, it's in a more sophisticated context. Not exploitive, guess, not exploitive. I don't really know another way to put it, but it's just like it can also exist yeah right like like se the consideration of sexuality within this framework uh or or, or this topic you know yeah um yeah. we're looking at also animals just, here you know right but also just you know there there is a, a lesbian relationship and there's yeah. a, a somewhat explicit eh, it's not explicit but like there is a there's nudity and there's a representation of them making love and um you know that is such a i was saying this earlier it's like such a cheap cliche that's all i was going to say and the film deals with that really well it's not you know, it's like, what's the, the simplest way to sell tickets? It's like, oh, make well, them lesbians. I, well, and I, I hate mean, that so yeah. much. Like, like so even yeah. like like prestige TV, it's like, and then the, the woman kisses the woman. You know, it's just like, come on. Right, right. You yeah. know, I, I, I wanted cheap. to. I wanted to. But it's not I like wanted, that. 
I want to ask a question about that just before we throw to the soundtrack of this movie because I do want to talk about that. But oh, real quick, no. <clears throat> but before we do that, um, I, I was just curious about the lesbian relationship in the movie because um, it is handled so well in this movie and I think it deserves all the credit for that. Um, but was there, besides Tori's real life and maybe something that she had in her real life, um, uh, sorry, uh, Patrice Donnelly, her real name, sorry. Was there something that happened in Patrice's life that sort of inspired that into the movie? Or was it something that they did in order to make that relationship or that part of the script more interesting or just different? Yeah, so he's, what he says when he was asked about that is that um, this wasn't based specifically on a romantic female relationship, but that he thought because they were females ostensibly competing with each other, it would be interesting to create that that narrative dynamic, right. that conflict. Because and, so co- and it's yeah. interesting. Well, it's, and he says this over and over, and there's a lot of quotes that I pulled, which are really cool. He's like, it's it's not a film about lesbians. It's a film about how do you compete with someone that you're in love with? Right. Because they're wow. lesbians. Okay, nice. whatever. But that it's like, he was like, wow, that's an interesting dramatic situation. That's a dramatic. Right. If, and how, men, in, how do you, like men and women don't compete very often in sports. You know, because exactly right, uh, exactly. Uh, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be there wouldn't be, that, yeah, there wouldn't be a situation where that yeah, there wouldn't be a situation where that would happen with a male only in like only right. in Starship Troopers and American Gladiators would that ever happen, and that would hey, be a cool film, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, can I, I also say one thing, Evan, about this? So I'm going to put another magazine. If you yeah, oh my god, but save me some time for the that. music. Save me some time for no the music. sweat. Okay, so this Playboy, this Playboy is a good example of how this is pretty multifaceted, right? Like, like there, there is an element that like wanted to market it this that way right, as an erotic right. movie, and right. and and I think Robert Town did sell some of the film stills from the steam room scenes to Playboy, oh, which is I think upsetting oh, to a few people, <laughs> and so it became like a movie that's so the movie so awesome and authentic and, and kind of transcends that. But yet the culture yeah. of course is still in that place where they're going, Ooh, lesbian film, erotic yeah. movie. And all, this whole article is like asking him constantly, like, but did you mean to make an erotic film? And he keeps on being like, that's no, it's a movie about wow. competition. It's a movie about excellence and pain and endurance and yeah. all this shit. And, and, and friendship and, too. Friendship. Like they, they do have they, a really, the film ends on the note of their friendship. And it's amazing friendship. And it's like, it's like yeah, they're, yeah each other and they're there for each other and, and it's so cool because it, it transcends like any label that i honestly when you look at the two of them you're like it, it doesn't matter what gender they are or sexual or yeah. people that are just and, like there for yeah. each other and, and it's interesting and and nobody knows pain like a script doctor let's let me tell you that right. so i mean he definitely he, dials he, right he into that it. um so well, that's fascinating. Yeah, uh, amazing Playboy there. <laughs> that's awesome. You know, Marywell Hemingway cover on the Playboy before she would the pictures play. Pictures inside are pretty are pretty great. I wonder if we can like put some show. Oh, we will. There. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely put up. But this Figure is she's and, on the front. Then, of course, she's on the front what cover of Playboy. In the next year. Oh, I'm trying to say this. Trying to get it out. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No. <laughs> uh, she's on the cover of Playboy for this movie in the year uh, or two. Uh, before she would uh, basically play um, Ramy, help me out. Why my I... Dorothy Stratton? Dorothy Stratton, of right. course. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, who? Yeah. Uh, four Star Eighty. Uh, f- uh, other uh, one fucking hour title that we've. Yeah. Uh, this is a little foreshadowing of, of this. Which story. is very much about the male gaze. Yeah. And, <laughs> what are we? Uh, no. Uh, both as a, as a, an object is the film, and then the topic, you know, uh, in the, the story. Um, and yeah. then actually, that's a, that's an interesting comparison. To how yeah. very different and delicate and what a precious object per, uh, personal best is. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Total tiny side note before we just move into the final chapter. Uh, I was a little kid. This was on cable constantly because oh. when a movie was a flop, you were guaranteed to have it on 10 times a week because <laughs> the hits yeah. would only play twice a week. So I watched personal best a million times. I was like 10 and I was totally lost and I was confused <laughs> yeah. and bored, but I always watched it. And all I remember was, uh, why is that guy peeing? And is oh, she the, helping him oh, pee? Oh, yeah. talk about we that. We forgot. Yeah, she holds oh, his dick talk about that now. while he pees. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. it was yeah. just like one we of the bigger... We didn't talk about him at all. We didn't talk, we didn't about, talk him. about him. Well, the yeah, fact I that call we... him the, the bootleg Bruce Jenner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the fact that... Uh, he has that boring kind of Midwestern male yeah. handsome look. No that, offense, Evan. 
Uh, that's okay. Uh, that Marywell Hemingway, you know, her, her character gets, uh, you know, halfway through the movie gets involved with a former swimmer athlete, a guy, also a non-actor. Uh, yeah, he, right? he was an oh, Olympi- He was also an Olympian. Who he, he, was an he Olympian. did not want to. He didn't want to be in this movie. Yeah, that's oh, evident. Wow. Forced him to be in this movie. He's like, yeah. I do not act. Yeah, in this movie. he's a little stiff. Wow, but yeah, he's a little it. stiff. He's in yeah, it. He, I he, love him. Yeah, he, he's yeah. very real. And there's an amazing scene where I don't know if YouTube will let me even show it, but basically Marionwell Hemingway uh, basically holds his dick and helps him pee, which is pretty wild. That's in the, I wonder yeah. if that's based on uh, any Patrice exploits. Um, all right, I want to get um, to what about, the stuff, what about the fashion though? What about the fashion? Can we? We're out of time. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's, it's great. Watch about, it. What, what number that? One minute of music. One minute of fashion. Here okay. we go. Okay, music. one minute of music. Okay, the soundtrack of this movie does it not capture 1979, whenever it was filmed, yes. in the most perfect way possible because you have the most. Like, okay, first off, I think the first track in the film that's noticeable is the Doobie Brothers. <laughs> you know, it's just, just like. Yeah. Oh and then, like, my God. Fleetwood Mac and Billy Joel, even. I call it like. Um, Boss Gags. The, uh, what the music Mork and Mindy would listen to <laughs> in Boulder, Colorado <laughs> in 1979. It's very eight track helps. tape. Very eight yeah. track. Well, it's yeah. for, and they call it AOR, which is album oriented rock. It was a kind of rock station. They call it yacht rock now, but I love it. And it really fleshes out the feel during party scenes, which includes fashion. Yes. <laughs> okay. If you watch this movie for anything, like if you're not interested in any of these ideas or themes, watch it for the style. Oh. It's like perfect, perfect, perfect. 1980s. Adidas, beautiful yeah. worn in primary colors, runner yep. shorts, like the haircuts. Like th- when I when I first saw it, when we first watched it, I was like, I went online instantly. Yeah, and you bought I, I went, all I went, sorts. I went, last summer was a uh, summer of personal best. I was I like, yeah, you have your that. personal best it's collection for sure. I was like, come on, yeah, that, this is the greatest. Style. It is so if it's the dawn it of like. Style. It, it, yeah. if, if it's the dawn of female athleticism in film, it's also capturing the dawn of female athletic fashion in a, an incredible yes. way. And uh, way. like fucking Adidas exploding. Um, but it was so funny before we started recording, Tom, just because we're getting to the final end here. Just about sure. the music in terms of when you're talking about Doobie Brothers and Boss Skaggs, you know, the music that's actually Boss coming Gags. out, you know, in the late 70s and how sure. it just makes oh, where what music I was saying would before. go. Yeah. Make- so sorry. So for some reason, the, the film soundtrack, you know, Fleetwood Mac and all that, it made me think about a world where the dead Kennedys, for example, where <laughs> punk rock dropped like a bomb because all of us are like post punk rock existing. Right. And so it's factored in. But it but it just made the dead Kennedys and a song like, um, you know, like I Kill Children on their first album. It, it makes it seem in like suffocatingly psychotically horrifying <laughs> it was like a hint that the world was going to end in a year like the dead kennedys dropping like a bomb into yeah. the world of boz skaggs and the doobie brothers it just <laughs> something it just made me think of that you know because we take it for granted like oh it's harsh music you know whatever nirvana so anyway it's one of the thoughts that you get when you watch personal best oh so past the buzzer again two ah! weeks in a row um, Take it out of my pay, dude. <laughs> <All right. laughs> That's going to become your signature. Um, all right, everybody. That was uh, one fucking hour on personal best. That was great. Best. That was I fun. Think, that was fun. I think that was our personal best. <laughs> <laughs> That's really uh, stupid. Also, watch Jericho Mile. Check out Jericho Mile. I was just going to say, I was going to say that. Hang on. Continued yeah, reading. Is that what we're doing? Yeah. Continued yeah. reading. I got my sports films. I can get down okay. with this. Okay. Okay. No. Let's like rattle off a few sports films. I just, I was going to set you up, uh, but oh, so. I know, Ramey, that you're a big fan of another slow-mo running film, uh, which is actually Michael Mann's first movie, uh, TV, TV movie, movie. Yeah. Jericho Mile. And man, there's nothing like running in slow motion to Sympathy for the Devil instrumental in version. In prison. In prison. Yeah. No, that's some tough shit. But tell yeah, me about that, Jericho Mile. I, I just think that movie rules, and um, I was super inspired by it when I saw it. And I, I always try to. I'm like an evangelical person for that movie. Like I always try to spread the word because um, it's like it, I think it's inspiring. It's about a dude who's in prison, and uh, just the running. way he transcends that shit he just runs and he runs at like an incredible speed and they actually running run. on empty <laughs> <laughs> but yeah check, yeah check it out check it out because it's sure. kind of like a similar era and it's uh brian well, Dennehy plays a white supremacist in it oh in the prison yeah so we uh no that's the thing like there were like a lot 
let's just say many more jogging films than you ever would have thought <laughs> and jericho mile and i'll just i don't know just i actually have a whole list the, the one that comes to mind right now is running which isn't that great but it's michael douglas who just one day like <laughs> having a midlife crisis and it's like hey man i'm just gonna start like i'm just gonna start running yes. you know, and he starts running i need you to know? watch that i haven't seen yeah that it's it's okay but oh, like uh yeah man sports films not a lot of slow-mo but um <laughs> yeah oh well, well let's, let's let's wrap it up because we're gonna okay. have oh yeah. well, let's talk about next week actually sorry sure next week yeah we can uh, i mean look i mean i love movies uh sports movies in particular that have lots of slow-mo anything that is just kind of slow kind of slow oh shit oh, okay she's Sorry. back okay <laughs> um <laughs> let's uh let's talk about next week that is right okay we're gonna do something a little in vogue right now um we got a speaking of 70s films and 70s filmmakers we got a 70s filmmaker that uh is hot again right he's hot um <laughs> Talk to the touch. <laughs> to the touch. He just right came now. back from Cannes. Yeah. yeah right. Cans. And he's the so talk he's, of the town. He's the talk of the town. So we thought we would uh, cover one of his films. We've been meaning to actually for a very long time. And, um, you know, uh, Mark is still being out next week with, uh, what's it called? Um, Zebra Monkey Pox? Pox? Monkey Pox. Yeah. Um, while he's out still uh, next week. Uh, Ramey's going to be here. And... Um, and Ramy, we're going to cover one of your favorite movies of this gentleman, and it's actually one of mine too. There's a lot to talk about with this movie. It's very underrated, it's, it's I think. Dope. In his it's really filmography. Dope. Love, love, love. Here we go. We're going to be talking about David Cronenberg's wow. The Brood. One fucking hour on The Brood next week. Obviously, David Cronenberg has a new movie out, Crimes of the Future, uh, which is not really a remake of one of his older movies. It's just it's borrowing it's just the title. Titled the same thing. Yeah. Borrowing his own title. Weird move. Uh, but yeah. The Brood, guys. I mean, I don't know what to say. This th- this movie, divorce horror, it fits into that niche genre. Oh, love it. And um, it's talk know, about style too. I yeah, love the style. Absolutely. I love I love the, I, the I, snow I, suits. I, and the I'm not sweats. always I'm not always into. Yeah, I know those kids uh, um, winter snow gear. suits. But like, yeah, um, I'm not always a huge fan of him, but he really nails it on this one. I, I'm I'm a big guy in his first three. You know, like uh, you know, yeah, greenhouse features. Yeah. And uh, I get a little wobbly with him after that, but um, I would do any of the three. And so I'm in with yeah. the brood. And oh. I did have a childhood haunt because, damn, there was a TV spot when I was really little. And I was up late once, and it, had, it was for the brood. And it's, you know, all the evil kids are attacking the, the little girl and tearing through the wall. And I was just, like, really fucked up by that. It's an incredibly yeah, powerful awesome. thing. And then it's at the school. I was school. very young, too. Holy yeah. snikes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's awesome. But the whole thing, yeah, divorce horror, it's like the evil Kramer versus yeah. Kramer, you know, kind oh. of, because it was a big divorce, because divorce was such a big topic then. It was. And you know yeah. what, we should talk about that. We're talking about divorce social films. movements, like nothing beats some late 70s um, divorce stuff. Have movies. you seen Shoot the Moon, by the way? Shoot the Moon. Who are you talking to here? <laughs> okay, 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 okay. It's, it's one of my right, favorites. Well, well, really? It's one oh of my, my God, absolute- we, 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 oh, yeah. we got to talk. We, it's one of my favorite movies. We got to talk. Uh, and also, Pauline Kael went to town with her love for that film. I yeah, think that uh, movie is phenomenal. Best um, Diane Keaton performance. Be- like, Diane Keaton it's rips. So fuck- um, yeah, it's uh, amazing. Uh, Albert Finney rips. Um, all the kids yeah. rip. That, that poor actress who, who died young. Karen could- Allen. Karen well, Allen. No, no. No, no, Karen, Karen Allen. But no, no, the, the, the oldest uh, girl oh, in the family. Oh, my God. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She, was an, she was an actress who um, looked a lot younger than she was. So it's a little strange where I think she's like 17. She's playing a 12 year old. Oh, okay. She's Whoa. in that pedophile movie too. Right? Yes. And that, that, that horrible disease, you know, took her life. When she was really young, but she's such oh a great God. actress. God, I'm forgetting her name. Okay. So but, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe we should do this another. No, another. I, no, no. We'll stop right here. But just like, I think we could. No, no, no. I meant, I meant maybe we should do one fucking hour and well, shoot the moon. I, I, I was going to say well, maybe. Now. Let's do it. <laughs> Set the clock. Motherfucker. No, no, I, God I, damn. <laughs> What? I'm a really huge fan of that film in all kinds of ways. Oh, How about the God. soundtrack? Just like one yeah. piano note. Yeah, it's the yeah, jam. It's, it's the I, jam. I also Alan try Parker. to make people watch that movie. Yeah, Alan Parker. It's, it's the it's jam. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh my I traumatized God. my mother. I made her see it, and she had she had traumatic memories of. Yeah. Uh, I've been watching the divorce. Lot. But yeah. Well, oh, divorce. Yeah. I guess it's tune in brutal. next week, everybody, to see: Are we going to do the brood? Or are we going to do shoot the moon? I guess we'll have no, to find no. out. No, no. Shoot the brood. No, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna do, we're gonna have a side note whoop, on divorce. I think movies. we should. I think we should spend Let's do ten that. minutes. Let's, do that. Let's spend ten yeah, minutes of the hour saying. next week talking yeah. about shoot the moon, other divorce films. I think it's a great topical. Comment. It's topical. You know? Let's get into no, it. Man. Um 
it's yeah. contemporaneous. Uh, that's great. So okay. so okay. we're gonna I go deep divorce. on divorce next week. We're going deep on divorce. I want to get brood. divorced. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So talk of divorce next week. Uh, but uh, we cannot let you go. We can't let you guys go home. Right. Uh, empty-handed without your moment of zen but which uh, needs a little setup it does tom go ahead so i programmed at a movie theater i would cut the trailers when we made series this series was my idea called the body athletic it was olympics uh, document uh, documentaries on about the olympics there you go and uh one of the prominent ones it was the impetus of having a whole series, Visions of Eight, as we referred to earlier. Bing. And uh, shit's got the slow. It's got the sports. So we thought we'd play it out for you guys. Enjoy. All right. Enjoy that, everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you, Ramey, for subbing in this week uh, for Marcus. Yep. Thanks. Guys. And Tom, thank you very much. You. And uh, everybody have a great Cheers. rest of your rest of your weekend. And uh, we'll see you next week for The Brood. But here is your... Moment of Zen. Okay. Yeah. See you later, everybody. Good night. Bye bye. Good night. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. Mm-hmm.